So we're continuing today at Shades of Grace, uh, talking about uh, confessions of uh, performance. And last week, Amber shared with us. And did anybody re relate with what she shared last week? Was anybody relating mm -hmm. to, to the words she had? I mean, that was, that was, uh, that was a good word. I'd have to say it's one of her best ones. I mean, I was just, I was awesome. This was a great message. Um, and she was prepared, where today I'm not. <laughs> um, I mean, I am. I, I am living the grace that Jesus uh, has for us. And I'm trying to walk in it and trying to share it with everybody. And this whole big thing of how grace is operating in my life and in, in, in the lives of others. Um, you know, I, I'm reading and studying scripture and all that kind of stuff. So I am prepared. But did I come with a word today? No, but did God give me one during worship? Yes, he did. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, we were just going to kind of play off each other anyways, but... Uh, I'm going to give you about five minutes today. No, I'm Go ahead. Okay. I just, I remember, um, I mean, if you think about grace, if you think about really just the existence of grace and the times that you need it, and the times that you need it, uh, you could probably step back in your life and go, you know what? I could really could have used some grace in this area of my life. I could really use some grace in this area of my life now. Uh, and as we walk through life, I think uh, with every battle, with every struggle, with everything that comes and hits us, every mountain that we face, as Lisa shared today, uh, every mountain that we face, with everything that comes at us, it create something in who we are. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say that lots of times that it's something really negative. We may think that it's good at the time. When I was 11, when I was 11 years old, my mom and my dad, they divorced. Um, and that created something in me that I lived with and tried to do for pretty much the rest of my life. I still struggle with it today. And that is I try to perform enough and do enough and show enough and um, just to get your attention. Because I really want you to think that I'm good at what I do. So I really go above and beyond uh, lots of areas in my life where I want somebody to say, you know, good job, well done. And it all happens through, for me, it all happened through this abandonment in my life. I felt like I was abandoned at an early age. So from that, created, a, I had this need. And grace was there the whole time. Maybe at 11, it wasn't my place to figure out how that was supposed to be part of my life. At 11, I don't know that it was my job to say, well, here's the grace that you need to suffice this, this need that you have in your life right now. So here's, here's this grace. And it was there. And then, you know, so then that's, that's me, and that's how I was... I think at the early age that I can remember, that is how a situation in my life changed and, and like put this need in my life that grace could have fixed, that grace would have been enough, but through performance and, and, and needing for people to say, to acknowledge me and to see me for what I was doing, for people to come along and pat me on the back and say, good job. You know, but it was never enough. I've always uh, just really fought to get stand in the spotlight. 
to see, because I want everyone to say, good job, well done, because I need that, because I still struggle. I still struggle. I'm addicted. <laughs> I'm addicted to this performance. I'm addicted to this law where I have to perform in order for you to love me. Mm -hmm. I'm addicted to it. Mm. And it's hard to shake and get rid of. Because the addiction is, is really... Anybody ever been... Don't raise your hands. Anybody ever been addicted to anything? Mm -hmm. Did anybody raise their hands? <laughs> you told them not to. <laughs> <laughs> You know how bad it is to shake an addiction, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys are so addicted. Yeah, I'm going to say you guys. Myself included. We're so addicted to performance-based law. We actually love it. We actually enjoy it. We don't really want to get rid of it. Because we're, we still have this control. We think as long as we do... There's a reward. But the problem with that is, is you can never perform your way to get what it is that you're missing inside. You can spend your whole life performing to try to get this void that's missing inside, mm -hmm. and it never happened. Never. So grace exists in every situation of our life where it can come in and, and I just wish see I, I gotta be real today I'm gonna be real okay because this is confessions right? confessions this is confessions I wish I had one of those where y'all couldn't see me but I'm, a, I'm on what do they call it? change your voice a confession booth a confession booth how do they do that? Father, I have sinned. <laughs> Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I've never been to one of those. Anyways, so I'm going to be real today because I have five kids. You all, most of all, you know that. I have five. It's okay, I'll be real today. It's, it's good. I'm going to talk about the family. <laughs> you, okay with, you okay with me being real today? What? Are you okay with me being real today? He wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> Your kids are real. <laughs> I was listening. I have five children. And they are all different. Just like all of us, we're all different. We all operate different personalities, different characteristics, different emotions in the way that we show them. That kid right there has got to be more like me in a lot of ways than, and what I've come to find out is I don't like me. Or you don't like him. He's going to need some grace. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Yeah, don't make it mean anymore. <laughs> but I struggle. I struggle. Seriously, I'm being real. So I'm gonna I'm telling you my struggle today. Now I have my one and only daughter that could never do any wrong. <laughs> that's that's the way I feel. Never. She can never do any wrong. She walks on water. She is just, I have no, it's, it's crazy, I have no expectations of her whatsoever. Her pure existence satisfies me. Her pure just being who she is. She doesn't have to do anything to earn my love. She doesn't have to do anything to earn my grace. If she is upset, I want to hold her. I want to comfort her. I want, her to, I want to give her everything she needs to make her feel better. My son, 
<laughs> if he cries, I say suck it up. <laughs> if he's hurt, I say suck it up. <laughs> but then I beat myself up every night. Why am I so hard on him? Why does grace not exist from me to him? What's the problem? I think that he could always do better. And it's what for months we've been talking about. I always think he can do better. I always think he can do more. And all he ever wants me to do is put my arm around him and say, well done. And I can't do it. And I don't know why. But if I'm being real today, I don't know why it happens. I don't know why that exists. I have five kids, and he's out here on an island by himself where I put him. And I expect and I demand so much from him. And any time he lets me down, he knows. Because I let him know. And there's such a far, and it's not that I don't love him, it's not that he's, he is my son and will always be my son. There's nothing he can do to ever change that. Nothing. It is just a reaction inside of me, a feeling inside of me, where I demand so much from him, and I'm setting him up for failure. Because he's going to spend the rest of his life trying to perform his way to getting love. Mm -hmm. I realize it as a parent today. I realize that. And I pray about it and I fight about it and I, you know, my wife lets me know when I mess up in the way that she's supposed to. But it's that I don't know what it is. And I don't want him to ever have to think he has to perform his way for my love because you don't. Letting you know in front of all these witnesses today. <laughs> You're my son no matter what. Matter of fact, next time I call you to perform for my love, tell me you don't have to. How about that? That work? Say, I don't have to perform for you, your love. I'm your son. You love me anyways. Got that? We got a deal? Shake on it. <laughs> You gotta shake. There you go. <laughs> All right, we got to do. Doesn't that suck, though? Can you imagine the amount of pressure he feels? We do that to ourselves. We put so much of that pressure on ourselves to perform. Look how bad it looks when you do it to someone else. Think about doing it for yourself. I am gonna let you talk. I promise. Lisa, today. Lisa was on it. Was she not? Mm -hmm. I love that our worship leader spends time with Jesus during the week. Mm -hmm. And that when she stands up here, he speaks to her. Amen? Amen. Because I tell you, I didn't have, I said, well, we're just going to kind of play off each other today. And, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And, I mean, we know scriptures and stuff like that. But God gave me a word because of something that he spoke through her. And she's talking about Peter walking on the water. Peter walking on the water. And it's a storm. Waves are rough. You know, there's lots of stuff going on around him as he's walking across this water. And as long as his eyes was on Jesus, he was fine. But the moment that he took his eyes off and looked down, or looked to the side, he, he began to sink. He began to sink. Now, did Jesus let him sink? Or did Jesus reach in? Was Jesus right there at that moment to pull him back up and rescue him? And to, and to surround him with his grace. Grace was, a, if I... Maybe that's, is that where the lyrics for the song that you're sinking in grace? 
That's not even lyrics, is it? <laughs> is that lyrics to a song? No. If grace is an ocean. Grace, grace is an ocean. See, I'm not making stuff up. <laughs> but, see, I don't even, I didn't study it because I just did it during worship. So I have to look back on what I put. When Peter took his eyes off Jesus, walking on the water, he could have done everything in his power and control to stay on top. What was going to happen? He was still going to sink, right? So no amount of power in him, control in him, uh, I don't, you can put some, I mean, you can stand on the water and some skis for like a second if you're still going to sink, right? So you got to have some to, to drag you along some way. What I'm trying to say is, is that how skiing sounds? Sure. I don't know. <laughs> skiing. Am yeah, I got skiing noise? <laughs> That's snow skiing. <laughs> swish, swish. I'm trying to get somewhere. Leave me alone. What I'm trying to say is, Peter's performance, he was still going to sink. He could have performed, he's still going to sink. But Jesus reaches in with his grace and pulls him back out. Where performance will sink you, God's grace will keep you afloat. I think, Braden, what your dad just said to you, there are a lot of us in this room who would love for our dads to have said that to us when we were your age. Um, I, I, Vanessa said last week, you know, she was talking about no matter how good she was at basketball, she was never good enough. No matter how many points she scored, she should have scored more because that was the expectation that that her dad put on her. And, and it's, it's, you know, there are a lot of us in the room who, who can relate to that. And, and we, we tend to compare ourselves with each other. Like we look at each other and, you know, what a, what a great dad you have or what a great life you had. And, and I have, I, I think I, I grew up in the perfect family. You know, my, my parents didn't divorce when I was young. I didn't feel abandoned, um, but for some reason, in the perfect family, I still had the same feelings that Chris had in his family, that I needed to perform. I mean, imagine if your parents are perfect, how are you going to live up to that standard? <laughs> And, and it's, <laughs> that's why Amy said last week, I just gave up standards. I, I gave it up for Lent and never went back. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 really, it's really tough. And so, so for me, I, I grew up feeling like I had to, I always had to be, oh, goodness gracious. It, when I say perfect, I mean perfect. You just don't understand unless you were there and that it, it, it was everything had to the look the sound the perception everything had to had to come across it even my homework had to be done a certain way seriously um, I, I remember in, in um, elementary school we, we had to make posters for homework I mean like on the, you know the tear off sheets you know and, and we would have to make posters. I, I had to, at home, I had to do it in pencil first to make sure it was exactly right. And then I could go over it with the, you know, remember that? Anybody ever do that? Um, it had to be, because by the time I took it to school, it had to look like, you know, it was done by a professional. I, I couldn't, man, I'm, I'm an artist kind of person, you know, creative kind of person, so... I need a little bit of freedom in the way I'm going to do stuff. I, I, boundaries don't work for me very well. And, and all of that's stifling me, you know, holding, holding me back to where 
I had to do it a certain way. And, and it, it brought me to a place where I had to be the person that somebody else thought I had to be. You know what I mean? I, I, had, to, I had to be their image of me instead of me, who they thought I should be. And I'm not just talking about my parents. Um, but, you know, I, I, I came to perceive everybody saw me that way. That anybody who was my, a teacher or a pastor or a parent or, any, you know, anybody who was in authority, that that was the way they looked at me. Like, I had to live up to a certain expectation. So, as a result of that, a lot of performance set in. And... You know, last week Amber, Amber told, you know, she asked, What's, what are you afraid of? And the number one fear, if, you know, surveys that are taken, the number one fear is public speaking. That's the top thing is public speaking. And it's because we're afraid that somebody's going to judge us. We're afraid that, that we're going to be rejected, that somebody's going to judge us and we're not going to live up to their ex expectations. So, I, I mean, that was really true for me. Elementary school, I remember being terrified in, in a room full of people who were all my friends. And the teacher that I liked, I still couldn't get up in front of the class and do anything. In high school, I was terrified. I remember one time in high school, I'm like 16, 17 years old, and we were going around the class reading uh, a paragraph out of the book. And when it got to me, I put my, we were in a circle of chairs, I put my book on my, on my knees. I put my elbows on my knees and I put my fingers in my ears so I could read this thing without hearing myself do it. Because I was so terrified to even talk in front of the class. And then I got to college and had to take public speaking, <clears throat> which I hated every minute of. And I had the sweetest teacher who, who really helped me. I mean, you know, she, she knew how scared I was to do it. And, and, and she really, she really helped me, but I would, it didn't make me any less scared. I just got through the class. Um, I had to get up and conduct a choir, had to get up and conduct an orchestra, and the whole time I'm literally shaking to be in front of all these people. And then, you know, Jesus decides I should be in ministry up in front of the church every Sunday. And when I first started, it was every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night. And, and I remember, you know, I would... I was the song leader at first, so I would come back and sit down, and Judy would say, I saw your hand shaking, what's your up? <laughs> you know, because song leaders were like this. <laughs> well, most song leaders aren't quite like that, but I was kind of like that. Do you, know, do you know what happened to make me not of public speaking, of being in front of people? When I found out that God loved me, mm -hmm. he wasn't real wild about the me that I created. But he was really crazy for the me that he created. Um, and when I started letting go of the performance stuff and stopped worrying about what other people thought about me, I could stand in front of a, one person or a thousand people and, and talk and not not be nervous about it. I, I didn't feel like I had to perform anymore. So it's not about whether you accept me or not, it's just that I'm doing what I feel like God's telling me to do. Um, and the verse that, that Amber read to us last week, um, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. The reason he set you free wasn't to come over into his control, it's to come over into the freedom that he offers you, the life of freedom that he offers us. It's, it's not to come back into a place where um, okay, you let go of, of this constraint and you come into this constraint. Because there's, there's no if in his there's, there's no condition for his love. He just loves you. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't have created you. He created you to show you how much he loves you. And, you know, and, you know, we, we keep going back to this thing, you know, people, but, but that you're just letting people sin. You're just telling people it's okay to sin. No, because that's where the only if in the gospel of grace comes in. 
the only if is if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. If we sin, then it's already settled. What, what do you do when you sin? What happens when you sin? That's already settled. You have an advocate. Jesus is there. He says, this is mine. This is my child. He belongs to me. There's grace. Um, there's never a question about, well, what, do I, where am I, what am I going to do? When we, I, I just messed up. I just sinned. What's going to happen to me now? That part is settled. Because if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Um, and that's First John 2, 1, by the way, if you want to look that up. First John 2, 1. Is that practice? That's all we practice. <laughs> so, did we get it right? Yeah, yeah, I had yeah. it. I had to put that on somebody's Facebook status this week. So, I, I, it doesn't bother me. Do I ever get nervous? Yeah, but but that's not. Usually that's just because it's a new situation that I, I'm unsure of, and, and, and that's what we tend to do. We tend to run back to that place and hide in the performance, and okay, in a new situation, what do I have to do? And, and so that just, that, that always takes us backwards. It always brings us into bondage, but, but Jesus said that, or Paul wrote, that it was for freedom that Christ set us free. So since you're living in freedom, don't ever let anybody put you back in bondage. Don't ever let anybody put that performance back on you that you have to live up to their image again. Just like Chris told Brayden today, just say no. I don't have to. Um, I, I, I had a friend just yesterday that I talked to who's, he's 30 years old and his father still puts expectations on him like that. I mean, literal like you have to do this or whatever and um, when I see people who are still living like that it, just, it really I, I just want to go break them free from it physically I, wa I want to do whatever I can to get them out of that um, you got another story mm -hmm. Yeah, I got lots of doors. They want to go home today. <laughs> oh. Well, um, I want to read a verse from Romans 5, 21. Some of you probably saw on Facebook this week, somebody asked me what I meant by grace. And this is where I get my definition of grace. Um, Romans 5. 19 through 21, but I'm just going to read verse 21 this morning. It says that as this is this is from King James. I'm going to read from several different versions, so I'm going to read King James first. Okay, King James says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Got that? Did that make sense? Look right over your head, right? Like, okay, that's the Bible. Must be because he said it was. Romans 5.21. Um, can, can I just encourage you in this as far as you and the Bible goes? If you're just reading it to say you read through the Bible in a year, or to say I did my daily duty, I uh, read the scripture, and it doesn't say anything to you, you're wasting your time. You're just performing, and that's what we're talking about. You're just doing something that's worthless. The word is alive. And the word speaks to us. And what this verse says is really powerful. Um, so I'm going to read it from the International Version, which is maybe a little easier to understand. It says, Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Does that make sense? Did, does that say anything to you? That, Still kind of up here somewhere. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read it from the message. Now see if you can grasp something out of this for you. All sin can do is threaten us with death. And that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life. A life that goes on and on and on 
world without end. Does that say anything? That helps? Okay. So, so what really would help you would be if you took this and you made it personal for you. Because that's what the word is. It's, it's God speaking to you. And if he's not speaking to you, then what's the point? So this is my version. This is my um, interpretation of what this verse means. Because this is my definition of grace and why grace matters. This is why we don't go back to the Pharisees' law or even to Moses' law. Um, because, okay, I'll just read it. This, this, is, this is my interpretation. Sin once controlled and dominated me. Can anybody relate to that? Sin once controlled and dominated me. It was, it was what I did. It was who I was. It was my identity was in, in my sinfulness. My thoughts, my behaviors, and my destiny were all controlled by sin. Yeah? My thoughts, my behavior, and where I was headed were controlled by sin. Now that Jesus has forgiven and removed sin from me, which is what he's done, he's forgiven us and he's removed sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Now that that's happened, instead of being controlled and dominated by sin, my thoughts, behaviors, and my destiny are now controlled and dominated by grace. This is what he did when he brought me out of death into life, when he brought me from darkness to light, Instead of being controlled and dominated by sin, now I'm controlled and dominated by His grace. Does that make sense? This is not a crutch. <laughs> you know, you have people who say Christianity is just a crutch. People, people need to feel better about themselves. No, it's not what this is. This is not a crutch. It's an eternal foundation because it's been done by Jesus. It's an eternal foundation that my whole life is built on. His grace. Because he's the one who did it. If I had any part to do in it, if I had laid one brick in this foundation or had anything to do with the foundation, I would expect one day that part would crumble. The part that I put in there, would eventually it's going to decay and it's going to go away. But I didn't have anything to do with my foundation. My foundation was done by Jesus. It is Jesus because he's the solid rock. It's in spite of my sinfulness, in, in spite of the fact that I felt like I needed to perform, in spite of the fact that we don't understand why we react the way we do sometimes, why, why are there still days when I'm putting expectations on other people? Or why are there still days when I'm putting expectations on myself? Why is this happening? And I don't really understand it, but in spite of the fact that I don't understand it all, Jesus still offers me grace. Jesus still has given me a, a place to stand. He's, he's given me this unshakable foundation for my life so that now my thoughts, they're not always his thoughts. I'm, I'm, okay, this is confession time. My thoughts aren't always pure. What? I know you thought I was perfect. <laughs> I don't always think the highest of any of you. No. <laughs> and sometimes I think way higher than probably I should. Um, anyway, man. <laughs> In spite of that, sin doesn't control my thoughts. Even though my thoughts may at times be sinful, and at times my behavior may be sinful, my destiny is determined, and where, where my life rests is never shaken. Where I stand is never in doubt, even though my, because I live in the flesh, this right here is still flesh, I still live in a sinful world, um, but my thoughts and my behaviors and my destiny are all controlled and dominated by God's grace now. He loves me in spite of where I've been. He loves me in spite of what I've done. He loves me in spite of what I do today or what I'll do tomorrow. 
Um, there is nothing that can separate me from his love. Thank you always love. 